Welcome back to In Need of a Refill, where God's Word and the coffee are never in short supply. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, so that you don't miss anything that's coming up on In Need of a Refill. If you have a comment or question or passage you want me to look at, leave in the section below. We'll get to it just as fast as we can. There was a time back in 2010 where we were on vacation and it was um, it was a good vacation. We were in Malaysia and then all of a sudden it wasn't much of a good vacation um, because all of a sudden my hip was giving me issues. It had never given me issues before. I had no idea what was going on. It was like, okay, I had to limit the amount of walking I was going to do and well, let me just tell you, I can't speak for Europe. Uh, I can, I've only been to England on, on that front. But Asia, there's not much you can do that's not a whole lot of walking. I mean, you can take your life in your own hands and ride one of the buses, uh, but why, you know? But uh, some places even the buses don't go. So it was like, okay, I've got to make sure that I can uh, keep going. Well, when we get back from Malaysia, I'm like, I've got to get my hip better. We start classes at the end of August. So at that point, it was like, well, what am I gonna do? I spent a lot of couch time, a lot of, uh, didn't really have an ice pack. Uh, you know, they, they don't really believe in ice over there. Or, uh, you know, you could get it occasionally, but very, very seldom and not a whole lot when you could. So uh, even the drinks were tepid for the most part. So it was like, well, a whole lot of soaking time in a bathtub that was not really designed for soaking. So I'm busy, you know, soaking, trying to get the hip to feel better, okay. It's, starting to feel better and then all of a sudden Tassie comes running into the bathroom get out get out now okay what's going on here so we get I get to my feet and you know uh, get some clothes on what's going on here well when the repairman came to fix Something in the kitchen, uh, this was actually in Hung Yang, not the second city. Uh, basically what they did, there was a big propane tank that has, you know, a, a line running to the little bitty range. I mean, the range is probably maybe as big as one of the chair's widths. Okay, so it's like when he came to fix it, he put something on top of the line. And all of a sudden, there was a fire that Tassie thankfully had put out before I was able to get from the bathroom to the clothes to the kitchen, because there's an open window and nobody wants to see this. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm just saying, you know, but, you know, but it was a serious, serious crisis. Thankfully, it was averted. Good job, by the way. Uh, you know, but what we see is sometimes life is going great. Sometimes life is, you know, mediocre. It's fine. You know, things are going fine. They could always get better. But, you know, and then sometimes it's like that picture. You're going along, going along, going along. Oh no, there's a waterfall right in front of me. I don't know why I didn't see it or hear it, probably because these guys were on the phone. But uh, first thing Allie said when she came in this morning was, that waterfall has a hump in it. <laughs> I said, hmm, artist, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I said, I didn't draw it, you know, but uh, you know, sometimes it's like that. All of a sudden, we realize the bottom's about to drop out. 
and we've got to take action extremely quickly. We're going to be dealing with Esther today. Let me give you a little bit of a timeline, okay? Uh, what you've got is the Jews have finally gotten out of captivity. I mean, you've got Jerusalem destroyed in 586. you got Babylon falling to the Medo-Persians, 539. You've got the Jews being allowed to return to Jerusalem by uh, 531 because of a, an edict of Cyrus, which is actually in one of the prophets. It's really cool to see how God showed that ahead of time. But this is where most people would say uh, the Nehemiah that rebuilt the wall is. That is not the case, actually. It's a different Nehemiah. The wall is not built until down here. Okay, but what you've got is the temple worship isn't restored until 516. Or rather, should I say, the temple rebuilt for the most part. Um, so your story of Esther falls right here. It is the reign of Xerxes I. Uh, in most of the translations, it's Ahasuerus. Uh, I think that's a Hebrew name for him. But uh, so you're looking at 486 to 465. Basically, at this point, there's still temple worship and the law to be reestablished, and Nehemiah that actually rebuilt the wall, rebuilding the wall. So this is where you're dealing with here. So it's 486 to 465. Okay, so it is the height of the Persian Empire. It is Xerxes the first, and he is a big bad dude. Okay, except well, anybody see the movie Three Hundred? It's okay. Uh, don't go to it for uh, historical <laughs> accuracy, but it was one of those situations that <clears throat> Xerxes had an army that has been predicted by the ancient historians to be around a million. <clears throat> He's a big, bad, powerful dude. Okay, so here's what we get in Esther 3. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of all other people, and they do not observe the king's laws. So it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. If it is pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they will be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry on the king's business to put into the king's treasuries. Then the king took his signet ring from his hand, gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agai, the enemy of the Jews. The king said to Haman, the silver is yours, and the people also, to do with him as you please. Okay, before we get into it, anytime somebody says, you know, it is in your interest to fill in the blank, you should be very, very leery, you know, uh, because how do they know what my interest is? But that's beside the point. Sometimes people are difficult to deal with, okay? The reason that Haman wanted the Jews out of the way was one man. One man! Wasn't enough to kill him. Oh, no, we got to get rid of the whole group. Uh, you know, but mainly because that one man, Mordecai, would not give them what he wanted. <clears throat> would not show him the respect that he thought he deserved. That also should send red flags up. But, uh, you know, sometimes people are hard to deal with. I mean, your belief systems, attitudes, I mean, you know, sometimes people just rub people the wrong way. Sometimes they've got an attitude that needs to be adjusted. I mean, just flat up. The behaviors, sometimes their culture is 
so different than yours that you're just like, hey, no, I don't know why they do X or Y. Sometimes their laws are different. But see, here's the deal. Differences, if we are not careful, lead to fear. And they lead to hatred because of a lack of understanding. If I don't know why you do what you do, I, I give it, in most cases, the worst of intentions. At least most people would. Every now and then you'll find somebody, I don't understand, maybe it's this and it's a good thing. But most people, I don't understand what you're doing. I really gotta keep my eye on you kind of idea. But uh, the other issue here though, is Haman decides to stack the deck in his favor. He's not playing the situation, he's playing the man in this case. Greed. Paul says in Colossians, greed is idolatry. Okay? So what he's doing, tell you what, king, give me what I want, I will put 10,000 talents of silver into your bank account how would you like that? Just give me the signet ring. Let me get rid of these people. You don't like them anyway. Notice he's only telling them half the truth. Anytime somebody tells you half the truth, that means they're lying about the other half. So here's what we've got. Continuing on. I'm going to flip forward just a little bit into the next chapter. Here's one through three. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the midst of the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. He went as far as the king's gate, for no one was to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. In each and every province where the command and decree of the king came, there was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay on sackcloth and ashes. Good news travels. Bad news travels fast, right? So Mordecai finds out, you know, I mean, the edict's been copied. It's been sent to all the provinces, you know, that they've set a date. I believe it was uh, December 13th. But uh, they set a date. It's time to get rid of them. Well, Mordecai actually takes the right steps here. He does not go and reason with the king. That would have got him killed. He does not simply say, we have to rebel. <laughs> what he does is he mourns what's going on. And he doesn't just mourn alone. All the Jews in the provinces are mourning too. Because, I mean, they've got a ticking time bomb waiting on them. I mean, it's, it's basically like sitting on death row. You've got that day marked, and you've got that countdown clock going. Okay, so this is what they're dealing with, but he doesn't just stop there. He's not accepting it. Well, I guess we're going to die. Yeah, just give me my last meal. No, it's not like that. What he's doing instead is he actually mourns through the city streets all the way up to the king's gate which probably could have got him killed too but if you're gonna die then you know <laughs> what's a little sooner at that point i guess i don't know but so esther hears about this what on earth is going on here why is he doing it go go talk to him Go figure out what's what's going on. And that's what she does. I mean, she sends uh, somebody to go talk to him and investigate the situation. Now, Mordecai is not going on hearsay. He's got a copy of the edict with him. He's got the proof. Go show this to Esther and ask her what she's going to do about it. Okay, how would you like that? Somebody did just come and say, here's the evidence. What are you going to do about it? It's no fun. 
But what we've got is 9 through 12. Hathok, Caleb, you need to rename count. <laughs> Hathok, I mean, that works, man. Hathok came back and related Mordecai's words to Esther. Then Esther spoke to Hathok and ordered him to reply to Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king, to the inner court, who is not summoned, he has but one law, that he be put to death, unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter, so that he may live. I have not been summoned to come to the king for these 30 days. They related Esther's words to Mordecai. Everybody knows. I mean, they probably did. Don't be dumb enough to go into the king's throne room. I'll get you killed. You know, everybody knows. I mean, this statement right here, just these two little words can lead to not solving an issue, to not solving a crisis. To say, you know, everybody knows, so I'm just got to go hide in the corner. Bad idea. You know, it is a, a morally dangerous thing to go into the throne room without being called. I mean, it was. You know, but here's the thing. This uh, didn't have to be the case. The king could decide, hey, this interrupter, this one that has come before me, maybe he has something or she has something that I need to hear. That's not killer. I mean, maybe. But the, he hasn't asked for me. I mean, she's giving facts. She is giving facts, but she's also making excuses also making excuses. I could, but, you know, I haven't been summoned. You know, I, I could just wait. It's okay. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. This is coming to your doorstep. Don't be deceived by this. You're not going to escape. You will be found out. The truth will out. That is a proverb we use now. Don't think we can hide it. The thing is, you can deal with it now, or you can die when it comes up. So if you don't deal with this, someone else will. You know? Now, maybe Mordecai actually has this kind of faith that, you know, someone else will rise up to save the Jews. Maybe. I mean, it's been, oh, at least 100 years. Closer to 100 and... 140, roughly, depending on when you date this. Here's the problem. Most of the Jews probably didn't go home. Some of them did. Back in 97, uh, China gave, or rather, uh, the Brits gave Hong Kong back to China. Now what they did, Glenn could probably tell you more about this, but what they did, here's the basics, is give the residents of Hong Kong a kind of a free pass. If you want to leave, now's the time. We won't stop you. A lot of them left. A lot of them didn't. Because they, that's what they knew. They had a life there. They had businesses there. They had friends there. They had houses there. Things like that. So, you know, when it rolled around, that door closed and they were kind of just stuck like Chuck. 
But here's the deal. These guys were allowed to go back. 531, they could have left. They could have left when Nehemiah goes back to rebuild the walls. Some of them do. Some of them, though, decide, this is my home. So they're not going to. Relief and de deliverance was going to be on the horizon, or so Mordecai thought. But there's no guarantee. I mean, every time somebody avoids dealing with something, it gets a little bit closer to that, that execution date. So at this point, the question is, who's going to deal? Mordecai is saying, Esther, this is your job. You have been put in a royal position, possibly for this very reason. Well, at this point, the question is, is she going to let God use her to deliver the people? Now, here's the thing. The entire book of Esther, you will not find God's name. It's not in there. But, make no mistake, God is working in and around and behind the scenes through the whole kit and caboodle. Yeah, I thought you'd like that. Yeah. The question is, I mean, when things are needing to get done that make us uncomfortable, and make no mistake, it would have made her uncomfortable. Dealing with an issue that could cost you your life? Yeah, there's fear there. There's fear there. Make no mistake about that. Dealing with an issue that's going to bring sin to light? There's fear there. But there is also relief and deliverance when it gets done. So the question is, are we willing to do what needs to be done even when it makes us uncomfortable, when it makes us afraid, are we willing to deal with the difficult situations in our families, in our church? Are we willing to check on someone who is acting in unexpected ways? Of course, for unexpected, we have to know them. But then still, are we willing to let God use us through bad or difficult circumstances? Or are we going to push it to the side and say, no, that's somebody else's job? That's the wrong answer. <clears throat> Who knows, but for such a time as this, that we have been put in a situation that we have to deal with to bring glory to God and to bring his church to the forefront. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you don't miss anything that's coming up on In Need of a Refill. And remember, if you're ever in need of a refill on God's Word, all we have to do is take it off our shelves. Spend some time with Him. We won't regret it. Have a blessed week.